just before I start, a couple of things just to run through. Um, we will try and answer as many questions as possible. If people have more questions, then they will receive an email after the webinar with an email address to send their questions to. An email will be sent out an hour after the webinar asking you to fill out a feedback form and information will be here on where to download today's slides. Please do check your junk folder um, if you don't see that email. The session today is recorded and a video will be available on our website within the next week or so. One other thing just to run through before I start, uh, the value of your investments can go down as well as up and you may get back less than you originally invested. We do not offer advice, so it's important you understand the risks. If you're unsure, please consult a suitably qualified financial advisor. Tax treatment, including tax relief, depends on your individual circumstances and rules, and they may change. So that's uh, just set the scene and gone through the important risk warnings up front and just telling you what will happen after the session. Um, what we're going to run through today uh, is a few uh, different things. Um, firstly, we'll look at how major markets have done, a little bit of a look back. We'll also take a look at the key macroeconomic data uh, that we've seen over the first uh, four uh, or so months of the year. What I thought would be helpful is also to take you through some of the discussions that we've had with fund managers over the last couple of months as the coronavirus crisis has evolved. And actually interesting how that narrative has changed over the last uh, few weeks. Uh, and then we'll look at how to think during a crisis. Uh, we'll take you through some pound cost averaging. Uh, and also thought it would be useful to give you an update on the AJ Bell funds, both the growth range and the income range. And then finally, uh, run through how AJ Bell can help you. So I plan to talk for about 40 minutes to run through those agenda points. Uh, and then uh, thank you very much for those of you that have sent in your questions. Uh, we've had lots and lots in, which is great. Uh, I'll then spend the rest of the, uh, the session uh, trying to answer as many of those as I possibly can. So in total, the session will last uh, around one hour. Let's jump straight into uh, to asset class performance uh, and take a look at where we are year to date. I mean, clearly it has been uh, a very uh, bumpy ride uh, and we've seen all kinds of different performance from different asset classes. But I think it's useful here just to set the scene as to how different markets and different asset classes have performed over the last four months. So this data runs to the end of April. Uh, I did have a quick check before I recorded this to see if there was any material change uh, on now we're recording this and and there hasn't been. So this is this is relevant data. Uh, and we can see obviously a real disconnect here between government bonds, uh, which have been performing strongly as we would expect them to do in a huge uh, risk off environment where people are, are worried about what will happen in the future. Uh, and then uh, equities falling back quite sharply in some cases, but actually interesting to see that some markets have recovered quite strongly uh, over the last couple of weeks. All of this data is in sterling, and so there will have been uh, an effect from a weakening of sterling, particularly when we look at the performance of US equities. Uh, but we'll look a little bit more uh, at that in detail uh, over, uh, over the next few slides. Also, we've seen a, a big disconnect in terms of the different types of bond uh, asset classes, so government bonds performing well, and then high yield bonds struggling uh, and falling back. And of course, interesting also to see just how uh, poor FTSE all share has been to the UK stock market uh, this year, falling back over 20%. Uh, and again, we'll look at some of the reasons behind that over the next couple of slides. So digging a little bit deeper, Clearly, the, first, the last couple of months uh, have been one of the most volatile periods in history as uh, the coronavirus, COVID-19, has swept completely across the world, bringing the global economy to a standstill in, in a way that we've never really seen um, before. Uh, and, and that, of course, makes it quite challenging to, to understand, to interpret, and then decide how to react from an investment perspective. Now, equity markets in February and March, uh, absolutely uh, tumbled. And in fact, the last time I did one of these webinars uh, was in late February, uh, when markets were starting to fall. Uh, and we talked through some of the things that we were seeing uh, there. So uh, it's been quite a journey over the last uh, eight weeks or so since I recorded uh, that webinar. When we look at the data, the S&P 500 index in the US recorded its second fastest 25% fall in history. 
Only the 1987 stock market crash uh, saw a faster fall uh, than, than, than what we saw during March. Uh, and of course, that means that this was a faster fall than we saw in the great financial crisis of 2008, 2009. Uh, and for those of us that, that, that were working uh, in financial services at the time, and of course, for everyone who was in, uh, affected by that, uh, that's quite a staggering stat, really, to think how quickly markets fell uh, during March. Now, what we have seen is a really strong response from governments and central banks right across the world. They've looked to provide all the support they could uh, with interest rate cuts, uh, with governments paying people's wages. We've seen the furlough scheme here uh, in the UK, really in a way that, that, that perhaps we, we would have all thought would never have been possible uh, in our lifetimes when the government would step in to directly pay the wages uh, of many, many people. Interestingly, uh, people I know are in that scheme have actually seen their, their wages paid on time um, from the government, which again, perhaps surpasses many people's expectations given the scale uh, of the number of people who have applied to that scheme. And we just saw on the previous slide that the UK was one of the hardest hit global markets. Uh, and when we look at that, it's very interesting to think about the, the makeup of the FTSE All Share Index. Clearly, there is a very large allocation to oil, uh, the two big oil stocks in particular, so BP and Shell, in the benchmark uh, there. Uh, and there is also a very large uh, allocation to financials, to banks, uh, and so on. Uh, and these are two areas that have been hit very hard, firstly by the fall in oil price, and we'll look at that in more detail uh, just uh, in a second, uh, and also then the hit to banks as interest rates have been slashed. Uh, almost to zero, making it very difficult for them to earn uh, a large margin between the rate they pay us on our savings and the rate they charge us for our borrowings. Uh, and so that does look like it will hit bank profitability going forwards. Now, Asia has certainly proved to be more resilient, uh, and China and other parts of Asia now have been getting back to work to some degree. Not complete normality, um, of course, uh, but certainly factories beginning to reopen, retail uh, beginning to reopen. And as one fund manager told me, uh, every branch of Savills, the estate agents in China, uh, have reopened uh, around three or four weeks ago. So there's an element of normality, I would say, uh, and that has helped China uh, and uh, the Asian markets uh, become, really show some more resilience uh, to what is happening. Now, as we saw on the previous slide as well, fixed interest has been very mixed performance with uh, with government bonds being strongly positive, uh, corporate bonds much weaker and high yield selling off very sharply. High yield bonds will exhibit strong correlation to, uh, to the equity market uh, and therefore it is perhaps little surprise that we have seen such a sharp fall uh, in the high yield market uh, over the last few weeks and indeed some of that has recovered during, uh, during April um, as well. Uh, but a big disconnect there, uh, particularly even in investment grade. So the higher quality investment uh, corporate bonds uh, in March did actually fall back quite sharply. So let's dig a little deeper into some of these issues and look at the major, uh, some of the major macroeconomic uh, data in a chart form. So this chart here, I think is a really, really interesting one. So this is the Chicago Board Options Exchange Volatility Index. It's a bit of a mouthful, but what it's looking to do uh, is really capture the level of volatility in the market. Uh, and it does this through looking at the options market. I won't go into that today. Uh, and what I wanted to do in this chart is show a long-term picture that captured the level of volatility seen in markets during the financial crisis. And so we could compare that today. So if we go back to the left-hand side of the chart and we look at uh, around that, uh, that late 08, early 09 period, you can see that huge spike up where the index went above 80, uh, and then a gradual fall down uh, in, in volatility. So that's the financial crisis, uh, and it was a level of volatility not really seen before in history. What we've seen over the last decade or so is actually a period of actually very low volatility. There have been small spikes of volatility when markets uh, showed, showed that, that, that little pickup for various events. It could be the Euro crisis, um, it, it could be Brexit, um, but they really pale into insignificance with what we saw 
during February and March. And we can see that enormous um, sharp rise uh, in volatility right at the end of the chart there. And actually volatility peaked at a level higher than we saw in the financial crisis. Um, and as, as the old saying goes, markets go up on the escalator, uh, but come down in the elevator. And that really is exactly what we saw during the last couple of months. Now you can see just at the right at the end of that chart, we can see that volatility has, volatility has started to fall, fall back. Uh, and if you think back to March, what were we seeing uh, when, uh, when lockdown started? We were seeing 10% moves in the stock market in any single day, both up and down. Uh, and that's why we saw volatility hit these record levels. Uh, and of course, what we've seen in recent weeks is that that, that move in the indices, in the FTSE, in the S&P and so on, uh, has been much more muted. Uh, and so, yes, we might see 1%, 2% moves in a day, uh, but we are not seeing this 5 to 10% move in a day. Uh, and therefore, volatility has calmed down for now. That's not to say we won't see it again in the future, uh, but volatility has calmed down today. So on a previous slide, when we looked at markets, I talked about sterling and I talked about currency. Uh, and this, this chart here uh, is looking at the, the sterling versus the US dollar. Uh, and I've done it over the last year because, of course, it incorporates a wide variety of different events, uh, not least Brexit. Uh, and it, so we certainly haven't been talking about Brexit much over the last couple of months for obvious reasons uh, here. But what we saw when we started the year was that sterling versus the dollar was at around a 1.3 level. Uh, and then as the crisis escalated uh, and the dollar was seen as a safe haven asset, as it typically is during times of crisis, we can see that very, very sharp fall from around 130 to uh, around 115 um, to the dollar. So quite a big change uh, and a very rapid change uh, in, the, in the exchange rate there. Now, a lot of that was to do with a shortage of dollars around the world. So as investors were scrabbling to take risk off the table, uh, they were scrabbling for a safe haven, hedge funds were having to liquidate because markets were falling so quickly, people were selling uh, assets sharply, even the gold price was falling because people needed to raise cash quickly uh, and gold was one liquid way of doing it. Then there was this rush for dollars and it saw that rate uh, fall so sharply. Then when the Federal Reserve announced that they were flooding the market with liquidity, they were making dollars more easily available, you saw that bounce back very sharply. Uh, and so we saw the sterling dollar rate move back above 125. Now, as I talk today, it's come back to around the 123 level, but to move from 130 to 115 back to 125 uh, in just a couple of weeks, essentially, um, is phenomenal. Um, volatility in the currency markets, which are effectively the most liquid uh, in the world, which is why they've seen such volatility happening there. So let's look at a, a, another part of the market. Let's look at the gilt, uh, the gilt market. So this is the yield available on the UK 10-year gilt. Now, of course, we should remember generally when I'm talking about gilts, um, uh, I, I put at the start of any sentence that the gilts are effectively and should be seen as the safest investments or are seen typically as the safest investments in the market because it's a guarantee from the government to pay you back your investment at the end of the agreed term. Uh, and of course, we say should be there uh, because, of course, there have been sovereign defaults in history uh, where, where governments haven't been able to pay back uh, their borrowers uh, over the long run. But this is a long run chart over the last year, and we can see what's happened to the gilt yield. Started at about 1.2 um, for your 10 year, lending the, the, your money to the government for 10 years. We started at 1.2, uh, and even during Brexit, uh, it, it only went down to about 0.4 when the Brexit crisis was happening last summer, and when Theresa May was resigning, all kinds of things happening. We weren't quite sure what would happen with the UK economy. It hit 0.4, and then as we get into January, as we get into February and March, we can see that rapid collapse, much like we did with the currency, down to under 0.2 uh, for lending the UK government money for a decade. And then that very rapid spike as the government announced all kinds of stimulus. It announced a furlough scheme, it announced business loans and, and everything it could throw at the economy uh, to stop it from stalling. Uh, and the rate rallied very, very quickly 
from or widen sorry from around that 0.2 level to 0.8 and then has come back very very sharply again uh, and as we talk today we're sitting in around 0.23 uh, and of course we've seen the Bank of England cut interest rates uh, to uh, 0.1 percent so incredibly low levels and, and and really that's effectively we're at zero interest rates uh, the Bank of England has suggested that they won't go further uh, in, in cutting those uh, and so enormous volatility even in what would previously be seen as safe uh, and lower risk assets and this is a picture that's repeated itself across the world not just in the UK but in the US um, in Europe and of course, when we look at Japan, we've seen Japan has been running at uh, rates of around zero uh, for, for many, many years now. Uh, and even when we turn to Europe, where of course, we know we've had negative interest rates. Now, this is before the coronavirus crisis. This is simply to deal with the economic crisis uh, and try and get Europe out of its malaise that it's been seeing um, since uh, the financial crisis of a decade ago and indeed uh, with its own euro crisis in the early part of the last decade. So low, very low interest rates, um, sometimes negative rates, uh, and huge government bond issuance uh, will have repercussions on financial markets for, uh, for many, many years to come. So let's turn to something I think has been a really interesting um, phenomena over the last couple of months. This is the oil price, and we've had lots and lots of questions about the oil price uh, come in. I will turn, I will really go into detail on the oil price, uh, I think, on uh, in, in the Q&A session. I have had some questions uh, about it, but this is just to show uh, another event that is happening in the world at the same time as, uh, as coronavirus. So this is a five-year chart of the oil price in dollars. It's been trading really for a very long period of time between 40 and 60 dollars the oil prices have been relatively stable actually um, for for a good period of time uh, but of course there have been arguments going on uh, in OPEC and around OPEC around uh, around supply uh, and then in uh, in March we saw uh, we saw both the Saudi Arabians and the Russians fall out over oil production uh, and uh, and really think about um, uh, what that meant, what they wanted to do with production, uh, and, and, and we saw this immediate collapse in the oil price. So a 30% fall in a day, uh, and then a negative oil price. Now I'll go back into a negative oil price in the uh, in the Q and A, uh, rather than labour the point here, because but I do think it's it's a very interesting picture, uh, and, and really understands why the likes of uh, of BP uh, and Shell have been hit hard, why Shell has had to uh, to to uh, cancel its dividends for the first time since uh, since Second World War. Uh, and also, is, as we just mentioned, with regards to the performance of the FTSE All Share uh, Index as to why the UK market has struggled uh, so much in comparison to other global markets. So that's just a, a really a brief look through some of the major impacts that have been going on around the world in chart form uh, to try and bring to life uh, what's been happening in equities, bonds, commodities, and interest rates, and so on. Now I wanted to turn to really to the middle part of the presentation, which is around uh, how to deal with um, a crisis and volatility such as this. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and, and what I wanted to do, um, for those of you that tuned into the February um, seminar uh, webinar that we did, uh, you'll recognise this chart. I used it then, uh, and uh, I. I make no apology for using it again because I think it it really does um, highlight the, uh, the the phases of the market that we went through uh, in very short order. And so some of you may have never seen this before. So I think it's worth uh, it's worth going over. And for those of you that have seen it before, uh, it may be a, a useful refresher. Not least because you can think back to the last eight weeks of stock market performance and think about the behaviour of the markets and where we were on this cycle. So just as a brief talk through as a summary, this is the investor emotion cycle. It is, it's widely used uh, and it really tries to, to link behavioural aspects uh, of human emotion with, uh, with money and relate that to how we behave with our money in terms of what trades, uh, what investments we make, uh, whether we're feeling bullish and investing or whether we're feeling fearful and selling. Uh, and so from the left hand side, we can we can kind of ride this wave as we see markets rally 
strongly, we see optimism, we see excitement, we see thrill. Um, uh, and really, if you think about the last few years, as the markets continually hit record highs, bouncing higher and higher and higher, um, we've seen investors really pile into equities uh, because there's no other game in town. Uh, and you can imagine um, these types of uh, emotions going through investors' minds when they make these investments and they watch the value of their pensions or their ISAs uh, or any other type of saving. Uh, increase in value as they log on to the AJ Bell website and, uh, and other places where they might manage their money. Now, of course, when we tip over the top of that, when the news changes, when when the environment changes, um, we, we, we reach into something different. And if you imagine the news flow out of China in January, we start getting this anxiety um, as people start to think, well, maybe what is going on with coronavirus uh, in China? And then we get this denial. Uh, well, we think maybe it'll be contained in Asia, just like SARS pretty much was um, all those years ago. Uh, and then we start getting the fear when the virus started reaching Italy, when it started reaching Spain and the number of cases started to rise there. We get this fear. Uh, and then suddenly into March. And of course, at this point now, the stock market's starting to fall. And then we get into March. We get this desperation. We get this panic. Uh, and we get capitulation, we get these enormous falls of, as we talked about earlier, 5%, 10% in a day, uh, when, when people panic uh, and they give up on markets uh, and then we get this despondency. And then we reach this interesting point at the bottom uh, here, um, when, uh, when, and we saw this in, in really mid to late March, uh, where, where markets were, were really felt like they were on their knees. And we, Investors and everyone else only had no idea how the virus would pan out uh, and what it would mean for not just financial markets, because you know, in the grand scheme of things, I think we all accept that you know, that is just one side of this coin. The far more important side of this is the impact on human nature. And we should never forget the impact that the virus is having on uh, on the global population and, and the, the number of tragic stories that, that we hear for the sheer volume of people that, that it's impacted around the world. Then from a financial perspective, we, we saw central banks flood the market with liquidity, make those noises about doing whatever it would take to support the economy. And we start coming out of that other side and giving ourselves a little bit of hope, a little bit of optimism, uh, and we start getting the market to, to rally again. Uh, and I think that's really interesting to think about this year, uh, both, well, both longer than this year and this year. Uh, and this, this cycle can last a very long time, or it can happen very, very quickly. And I think it's clear to see over the last eight to 10 weeks that we've had a very quick cycle uh, as we've seen the market rally 25 to 30% from its bottom um, that we saw in uh, around the 19th, 20th of March. Uh, we've seen this 25 to 30% rally uh, and we've perhaps started to climb that, that wall of optimism, of excitement again. But of course, these things can change very, very quickly. And I'll come back to that in a little while. Now, we also included this, uh, this chart, uh, sorry, this cartoon uh, in the presentation back in, uh, back in February. Uh, and again, I've included it here. Some of you may not have seen it, but I really wanted to include it to give you some sense of perhaps how you were feeling and relate this to how professional investors were feeling too. Now, my experience of doing this job for the last 20 years is that professional investors at a time of crisis become amateur investors. They make the same behavioral mistakes that, that everybody else does, uh, and they forget their pre professionalism. Uh, and we see this panic, this fear, this capitulation that we saw on the last chart, and, and then we move through the wave. This is exactly what the cartoon is trying to uh, show you. Professional investors go through the same emotional problems that that, uh, that amateur uh, investors uh, and, and uh, that, that exhibit, uh, and, and that was a really key thing that we saw over the last few weeks. And that takes us neatly on to the conversations that we've had with fund managers over the last uh, the last eight to ten weeks. Uh, and it's really interesting how the narrative has shifted actually. So if we focus in on the, on our conversations during March. Uh, and I've, I've picked out a few a few bullet points here as to how those conversations went um, went with the fund managers to try and get give you a sense as to how they were feeling. Quite clearly in March, 
the first few weeks of the crisis, when we talked to managers and said, are you taking advantage of any of the opportunities? Share prices are falling. Managers were reluctant to do anything at all. There was a real sense that, um, that there just wasn't enough data, there wasn't enough information, uh, and they weren't able to make decisions based on, uh, on real evidence, uh, and therefore there was a reluctance to do anything. What was very interesting was when we talked to fixed interest managers, is that liquidity in the market was incredibly poor. Some managers told us that they weren't even able to sell government bonds at the very worst of the crisis. Now that's quite a telling statistic when you think about you know, looking to sell a US treasury, so a bond backed by the US government to, to agree to pay the investor back after a certain amount of time. Liquidity, even in that type of investment, completely dried up. Hedge funds were liquidating quickly. We heard that uh, news going around the markets. This caused a huge rush for dollars that we saw on an earlier chart uh, there when we saw the sterling dollar rate. So lots and lots of hedge funds that had very um, uh, leveraged positions and they borrowed a lot of money uh, to try and enhance returns. That really uh, just didn't work. Uh, and some of them went, uh, went bust and had to liquidate there. Also, what we saw, which is really interesting, is in the ETF market, so the exchange traded funds market, is that those investing in fixed interest traded at significant discounts uh, to, uh, to the, uh, the index themselves as the bond, the, the ETF pricing was moving faster than the market. Uh, and this gets into a whole world of what is the right price for an investment. Uh, well, quite, quite frankly, the price for an investment is simply what someone's prepared to pay for it. Uh, and and that, that saw ETFs trading at discounts to what some perceived as their, their net asset value. Um, that's something we haven't really seen in markets before. And, and the level of the discount was maybe five, six, seven percent in some instances, uh, which is a really interesting um, phenomena that was seen for the first time during March. Now, as I bring it back to the whole behavioral finance side of things, when we were talking to our fund managers in March, early on, it was quite clear that fear and panic was in evidence in some cases, just like it would have been, uh, I'm sure, for some of you when you were investing uh, and, and looking at your own valuations and your own plans. So if we move that forward to the latter half of March, there was as central banks uh, started to ease liquidity and provide liquidity to the market, there was a huge sense of nerves being calmed in that last week of March. Uh, and we could sense this when we talked to managers. Now we were talking to four or five different managers a day uh, when we were doing this. Uh, quick calls from home on the likes of Zoom and Teams and so on that we've all become experts in um, in, the last, uh, in the last few weeks as that's the way we now, uh, we now work as we have to. But there was a real sense of change of, 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 uh, of behavior from when we talked to the fund managers. Now, what was clear is that data was becoming more reliable. You know, and we can have a whole discussion around the reliability of data on, uh, on tracking virus cases and how different countries are doing it uh, and are they really comparable. But what was important in March is that we, we began to get a sense that, that people started to trust the data. Uh, and that gave investors optimism that they could start to look forwards, uh, maybe six months, maybe one year, maybe three years, uh, and stop just thinking about the next day, the next week, the next month. Uh, and that is very, very important for an equity investor. Uh, equity markets are forward looking by very, their very nature uh, and they're generally thinking about the next year and beyond rather than what's happening in the here and now. And the data enabled them to do that as the quality of it improved. Now what we saw in March was the start that fund managers were starting to look for opportunities uh, to invest. They were starting to take advantage of some of the changes uh, that were happening that good qualities had been sold off as well as bad, uh, and they were beginning to reposition their portfolio. Uh, and that was evident throughout April as well. So a real sense of, uh, of hope uh, and optimism, again, linking it back to that behavioral finance chart. There is definitely a clear consensus out there that there will be a major recession, but there is a strong disagreement when we talk to our managers into the length of that, um, that recession. So you may have heard, you may have read about um, certain letters being used to describe the recession. Some people talking about a V-shaped recovery, uh, so a very sharp recession, but a very sharp recovery uh, in that. 
Others are talking about a U-shaped recession, so perhaps taking a little longer and a more gradual recovery. Uh, and others have now, in more recent weeks, started to describe this as a bit like a Nike swish. So if you picture that kind of tick um, there, where it's a, a sharp, uh, sharp recession and then a much more gradual recovery. Now I have no idea on what length this uh, the recession will take. I, I think we could all be in a strong agreement that there will be a recession, that we are we are in a recession um, uh, as as economies have completely shut down. Uh, but the key will be how long does it last? And that's where there is definite disagreement when you look and talk to different investment managers. Now, what we've also seen in the last few weeks is, is fund managers shifting their emphasis to those companies that have weak balance sheets and will struggle to survive. So they're really trying to weed out who, who will be the winners and losers from, uh, from the impact of the virus. Now, of course, that's, as I mentioned before, we mustn't forget the human impact uh, of, of what is happening, but that is that is capitalism. That is exactly what's happening uh, in the stock market. It is looking and assessing those companies that will go bust, those companies that will survive, uh, and those that will prosper. And managers are starting to position their portfolios accordingly. So that's what managers are doing. What kind of things can you do as investors um, to navigate a crisis like this? I've put together just a few thoughts uh, and I've tried to um, to summarize it into two different uh, two different camps really uh, using dad's army as my as my guide uh, so I've started off with private Fraser uh, and for those of you that have watched dad's army and my guess is right now it's probably on repeat on a loop on BBC I haven't watched much TV recently but I'm pretty sure it's full of repeats so I'm no doubt dad's army is there uh, at the moment but if you think about Private Fraser and his, his well-known catchphrase, we're all doomed, doomed. I certainly won't try and do it in the Scottish accent. So uh, I've saved you all uh, there from that, that, that attempt. But you know, what's he really saying there? Well, he, he is in a position when he talks about every event that emotion trumps rational thought. Uh, and this is how not to navigate a crisis uh, here. Uh, and and, and yeah, it's really, really important to try and keep control of your emotions uh, and think rationally, however difficult that is uh, during during a crisis, during what was happening you know, in March, as the data got worse, as the, the the number of cases continues to rise, as as perhaps we all as perhaps we become affected, as we know um, friends or family that are actually affected by the virus, and, and of course I'm conscious that some of you may have lost loved ones and friends and family. Uh, to the virus as well, and uh, my heart, my heart goes out to everyone that's been uh, been affected by that. But from a finance perspective, um, it's about staying rational. Now, as we saw previously on the previous slide, you know, it's clear that investors, professional investors, struggle to stay rational during March, and so I absolutely accept it's very difficult. But I think it's important to try and think clearly. What we see is the current situation of the here and now gets extrapolated into the future. Um, uh, and it's very difficult to see a way out of our current crisis. Uh, and, and that we have to remember that that's not how how it works. If we were if we take ourselves back to 2008, 2009. In the here and now, at that point, it was about thinking the financial system will never be the same again. Banks will go bust. Banks will never lend again. Uh, and the whole world will change. Well, actually, a decade on, it felt like not much had changed. Now, I'm sure things will change uh, as a result of the virus and how we live our lives. And of course, uh, the whole use of technology has been one of those things that changed very quickly over the last eight to 10 weeks. But it's important not to extrapolate the current situation uh, and to think about how, uh, how we will go back to some element of normality. What we also see from investors during a crisis is the plan gets forgotten. That long-term nature, um, of investing, you're saving for your retirement, you, you might not be planning to retire for another 20 or 30 years, uh, and, and we know that time is an investor's friend and it gets chucked out the window uh, and we forget the plan. It's vitally important when you're investing to remember the plan. What we see is investors cap capitulate and sell at the bottom. Going back to our behavioural finance chart, uh, it, it, it's that, that period of maximum uh, despondency is investors panic and, and, and capitulate and sell right at the worst possible time. It's absolutely not how to navigate a crisis. 
uh, and we see losses get locked in. And of course, you know, we know good old mathematics. Um, if your investment loses 50 percent, then it's, take, it's got to recover 100 percent for you to get your money back. Uh, and so it's very, very important to think about what you're doing uh, with your investments uh, and you know, not to lock in losses unnecessarily. So that's private Fraser. That's not how to navigate a crisis. It's not about uh, emotion trumping rational thought. So you might have been ahead of me. You might, you might have been thinking, uh, knowing where I was going with, uh, with this one. Uh, here's the next character we can look at, perhaps for how we can navigate the crisis. Um, it's good old Lance Corporal James. Now, of course, I'm, I'm aware that when he said don't panic, it sounded like he was actually panicking. But the message is clear. Don't panic. It's important to remember why you invest. What are you actually trying to achieve? Um, what is the plan? We just, I mean, unsurprisingly, a lot of these points are the equal and opposite of what we saw on the last slide. So why are you investing? What is the plan? Why am I saving for my retirement uh, here? When is my retirement? If it's many, many years away, uh, then you don't need to panic. You, you, you don't need to be um, private Fraser and think we're all doomed. You need to think about not panicking. Acting on information, not emotion, becomes very, very important. Some of the best managers we meet and we talk to, they are all about the, the information and not the emotion. You know, sometimes in the meetings we have with our managers, some of them come across as very, you know, actually quite cold and emotionless. Uh, and I think that's not the worst uh, characteristic to have for, for, uh, for a fund manager, because I think it, it enables you to stay rational. Also, it's really important in a crisis and any other time, of course, to understand your risk tolerance uh, here. Now, often in times of crisis, we think about our risk tolerance more so because when we log on to our valuation and we see our investments have lost money, uh, it's very easy to, uh, to forget our risk tolerance. But of course, when you're investing in equities, there is a chance that you will lose money. And there is a chance you will lose lots of money. Uh, and if you're not comfortable with, uh, with that structure and the ability for losing money, then you need to make sure that your investments marry up with your risk tolerance. Uh, and we've got some, uh, some tools uh, or some, some information on our website to help you with that. Now, as ever, and every time you will have heard me speak, you'll hear me talk about diversification. Diversification is an investor's friend. And this is about ensuring that you've got a diversified portfolio, that you haven't got all of your eggs in one basket. Those of you that were diversified uh, over the last few weeks uh, will have had your investments um, protected. You won't have suffered the same degree of falls that perhaps some other people uh, would have done who don't have that degree of diversification. Diversification comes into play in the times of crisis. It's easy to think, why, am I, why have I got all of this diversification? I'm missing out on great returns when the market's rallying. But you know, I always describe this when I'm talking about my portfolio uh, to my investors. It's always about looking at my portfolio and thinking, uh, if things get tricky, who's wearing the parachute? Uh, who, who's going to help me out when markets fall sharply? That doesn't mean I want all of my investments. Uh, in those type of managers, but it does mean I might want some of my investments in those type of managers in the knowledge that they should help me out when things get difficult. So one of the things I just wanted to look at is that is the whole concept of pound cost averaging. Uh, and I've entitled the slide here, pound cost averaging a nervous investor's friend. People spend huge amounts of time trying to time the market. Now that goes for professional investors as well as amateur investors. But the vast majority of investors, both professional and amateur, fail in this task of timing the market. Lots and lots of people sat there in cash just waiting and waiting because they think there'll be a better entry point. The reality is that nobody knows when the bottom of the market is going to be or when it was until the bottom of the market has already passed. You know, it's only now I can look back and say that in mid-March, markets bottomed out in this phase of the market. Now, there is no say, there is no certainty that markets won't hit an even lower point than this in the future if information changes, if things change. And maybe the FTSE will fall below 4,900 um, again. I just don't know. But 
Yeah, I'm sat here as a as a fund manager with uh, and a researcher with over 20 years experience, uh, and I am acutely aware that it is almost impossible to try and time the market. There's another old saying, and I've probably listed a few in this in this presentation already. It's time in the market that's important, not timing the market that's important. Now, one of the ways to navigate that is to phase money into the market, because it takes away some of the emotional attachment of trying to time your entry. Now, I'm acutely aware if you've saved up, you've got your hard-earned money, you may be sat there with £20,000 in an ISA, and you want to invest it uh, into the stock market, uh, but you're very, very nervous. Investing a large sum of money in one go feels like a leap of faith. But actually, phasing the money into the market can take away some of that emotional attachment. Uh, and therefore, whether it's saving for retirement, saving for your children's future via a junior ISA, yeah, or indeed your own ISA, then this method could be really helpful. Yeah. And let's not remember, for the vast majority of us who are saving for a retirement, we're probably actually doing this without even realising. We're putting money away on a monthly basis into our pension for our retirement. And so many of us are actually taking advantage of pound cost averaging already. But there are other methods, say for your junior ISA, for your own ISA, where people are investing lump sums, when even if you've got a lump sum, you might want to phase that into the market over a period of time rather than trying to time the market. So I'm just going to talk you through an example here uh, to see how this has worked over the last 20 years. So there's various figures on, on this. And, and what I did to try and bring this to life was look back 20 years. Uh, sorry, I'll start again. I've looked back over the last three years, five years, 10 years and 20 years um, to look at uh, whether it made a difference to my returns as to whether I saved on a monthly basis, a quarterly basis or on an annual basis uh, here. So I've used the example here. For my monthly basis, I've saved £100 a month. For a quarterly basis, £300 a month, and for an annual basis, £1,200. So on a quarterly basis, £300 per quarter, and on an annual basis, £1,200 per annum. So for each example, we're saving exactly the same amount, but we are saving it uh, in a very different way. Uh, and looking back, um, we are looking back uh, to see how these returns have done. Now, I've done this looking at the FTSE All Share Index. Uh, and we can see over three years that the best return was had over the last three years to the end of 2019 uh, was actually to invest on a quarterly basis. When we look on a five year basis, it's a monthly basis, a 10 year basis, it's a monthly basis. And over 20 years, uh, it's also a monthly basis. So over 20 years, you're actually just over £1,000 better off investing on a monthly basis. Uh, I'm sorry, I've spotted an error in my data. I do apologize for the very last one, the 20 years there. The 20 year one, you should, uh, the eagle eyed a month you will, will, will notice that should say quarterly. So my apologies to that. You're actually just over 1,000 pounds better off investing on a quarterly basis than you were on an annual basis over the very long period of time. But the overarching point here is, on none of these examples, were you better off investing on an annual basis? Are you trying to time that market? Phasing your money in over a longer period of time was key, was actually the, the better solution. So just as I come towards the end, I wanted to give a brief update on the AJ Bell uh, funds. We get lots and lots of questions about this. So looking at the AJ Bell growth funds, the performance of the growth funds has actually been broadly in line with expectations uh, over the last couple of months. There's no denying that market falls have been painful, uh, but each fund has behaved in a manner expected given the sell-off. And I think that's important. It's about giving, uh, giving you as investors the return profile that you expect over the long run. Uh, and that is exactly what is, you know, these funds are behaving as we would expect over the last couple of months. They remain diversified, and this diversification has been helpful as the equity market's been falling. Talked about the importance of diversification just a couple of slides ago. We updated the asset allocation in February on the growth portfolios, uh, and this resulted in the addition of US government bonds at the lower risk end of the portfolio, uh, and that was very helpful. We also have, have exposure to different sectors, so technology, healthcare, and consumer staples, and all of these outperformed the market this year. 
<coughs> excuse me. Just turning briefly to the income funds. Um, well, the income funds in previous market sell-offs, companies in, that paid a dividend, investing in companies that paid a dividend have been a very, very good strategy. <laughs> now, this sell-off has been very different, with many companies postponing or cancelling their dividends, uh, or indeed being told to by governments. And so this is quite a different environment than we've seen previously. But <clears throat> excuse me, I've got a little frog in my throat from, from talking for a while here. Now, as a result of this, higher yielding markets and sectors have fallen very, very sharply as investors expect dividends to fall uh, in the coming months. And so it's certainly been a challenge to be an income investor uh, year to date so far. So over the next 12 months, uh, we would expect the income generated by the two in income funds to be at the lower end of their long term range. So we, we talk about a target income range of three to five percent over time. Now, given the extent of the dividend cancellations, we would expect this to be at the lower end of this range. Now, we, we recently put an article on our on our website uh, talking about the, the, the dividend challenge. Uh, and uh, if you want more information, then I would urge you to, to read that article uh, there. I think there's some useful information looking at the structure of, of the market and where dividends come from. Uh, and also, of course, Russ Mould uh, has put out quite a lot of interesting comment on our website around those companies that are that have paid a dividend or have cancelled a dividend. Uh, and we've got a monitor on our website uh, for, the, for those companies and what's happening with their dividends too. So lots of information to help you with, but clearly dividends will be lower going forwards. So just, just summing up, uh, just before I turn to the, the questions that, that we've had in, um, just a quick, how can AJ Bell help you uh, through, through this crisis and more generally with your investments? Uh, and I put this with a number of different types of approach to help you. Of course, we've got the whole range of universal investments for you to choose from on our website. So if you're confident and comfortable making your own investment decisions, then the, there are many, many different investments for you to choose from. For those of you that, that, that perhaps want some help with your research, uh, the favorite fund list uh, or the more recently launched investment trust select list uh, are there to help you with your fund research, to help you choose investments that are right for you. For those that want perhaps uh, a helpful uh, starter with a pre-built portfolio, then we have our ready-made portfolios uh, with a range of different portfolios based on your risk appetite. Uh, and then of course we have our growth and our income funds that I've just been talking about uh, with cap charges for those of you that want to, to, to hand over um, to AJ Bell to, to, to run the asset allocation and the underlying investment selection and indeed make the changes uh, for you. So a whole range of different options to help you dependent on how much help you need to manage your investment. So hopefully there's something there uh, for everybody. So turning to the questions, I'm conscious I've talked for a long time and hopefully that's been helpful thinking about different parts of the market, what's been driving the market, how fund managers have been responding over the last couple of months, uh, and also thinking about uh, different tools to help you deal with your own emotions and your own investment strategy uh, there. So let's, let's turn to some of these questions. We've had lots and lots in, so I'm apologies if I don't get to your own question. Now, first of all, I'm just going to start with a question we had uh, regarding the market recovery over the last few weeks and what the potential impact of it is of a second wave uh, of, uh, of coronavirus. Now, that's a really interesting question. Now, I, I wish I had a really clear answer for you as to what will happen. I don't know. What, what I can say is it's interesting to look at what's happening in Asia in the last couple of days. So we've seen Korea have to impose uh, more of a, uh, reimpose some lockdown there uh, as, of, as uh, virus rates started to increase again after an unlock. We've seen the same thing in Germany uh, as well in the last couple of days. So I think governments are acutely aware uh, that there's a very real risk of a second wave. And actually, you did see markets sell off in the last couple of days uh, on the back of information regarding uh, an increase in cases and a, and a potential second wave. So I think it's a very real risk to markets. Uh, it's a very real risk to the strong rally that we've seen. Uh, and, and I think investors are looking at this very, very closely. Now, on a related theme, uh, we had a question uh, regarding uh, the, uh, the global recession and the type of recession uh, that is priced into markets. Now, I, I touched a little bit on this when I talked about the shape of the recession uh, there. Now, I think it, it's easy to, I think, to assume that given the strength of the rally in the last 
uh, the last few weeks uh, is that a lot of market participants are hoping for a V-shaped recovery uh, there. Um, uh, it doesn't feel like a prolonged recession is priced into markets. You know, when you look at, uh, at certainly uh, the US market and evaluations uh, there, then it feels like uh, that a V-shaped recovery is very much at the forefront of investors' minds. Uh, and that, that uh, when we talk to some of the fund managers we do, and indeed you look at the bond market, I think many uh, other managers we're talking to are thinking that this could be a deeper and more prolonged recession than other market participants uh, are talking about. Now, time will tell uh, on this one, but, uh, but, but it certainly does look, it will take quite a while for capacity in the system to recover, uh, for for those of it, for, for us to go back to an element of normality uh, and and undoing the damage that's been done to the economy uh, from this shutdown will be very much a challenge. Now, someone did uh, I, I did talk about the oil price, and so we'll, we'll come back to that in, in, in more detail. We had quite a few questions around how could an oil price go negative, and I think that's a really good question. I think we've all had to resort to uh, to doing a bit of research around the oil market here. So I wanted just to touch uh, briefly on, on on what happened. So the oil price went negative, and the oil price operates uh, in the futures market, uh, and and that's all about a derivative contract. Uh, where there is an agreement to deliver oil at a specified date in the future. Now, what happened uh, is that uh, as the the, the, few, the one month or the, the May, sorry, I'll start again, as the future uh, date came closer and closer and the delivery date came closer and closer, basically the, the inventory, those people that held the oil couldn't hold it and they needed to get it off off of their books and therefore the oil price went negative basically because the people holding the oil wanted at any cost to get it off their books and so if you were in a very lucky position of being able to take delivery of um, a whole load of oil within 24 hours those people who held the oil would actually pay you to take it off their hands so it actually went to minus 40 dollars so you could get paid $40 per barrel for being able to take delivery uh, within 24 hours. Now, of course, the reality is that just about nobody could take delivery uh, within that period of time. But the, the oil market operates on a rolling futures basis, uh, both short term and long term uh, for delivery in the future. If you look at the oil price now for one year's time, the oil price for delivery in one year's time is about $32. The price today in the for delivery in one month's time uh, is about $24 at the time, this time of making this, this uh, webinar. So it was very much to do with a, a technical factor, a short term delivery. Um, but of course, it, what it means is be very, very careful uh, around investing in commodities that are dealing in the futures market. Now, we have some questions around income, and I, I, I spoke briefly just now around income. We had some specific questions around investment trusts and how they can deal uh, with income. Now, investment trusts and uh, unit trusts or OICs deal with income in a different way. So OICs and in unit trusts have to pay out all of the income that they get from the underlying investments uh, on an annual basis. Uh, and so they get their dividends in from Shell, from, um, oh, clearly Shell, a bad example right now is they cancel, but you'll understand why I use it in a second. And they get their dividend in from Shell, they get their dividend in from, uh, from Vodafone, et cetera, et cetera. And then all of the income that comes in, uh, they pay out to uh, investors after any charges that they deduct from income, which they may well do. An investment trust operates in a very different manner. Um, an investment trust actually is able to hold back some of the income it gets in the good years for use in the bad years in what's called an income reserve. Um, so let's let's imagine a scenario they get they get dividends in of a hundred pounds for the trust um, and they want to pay out a dividend. Well, they might pay out maybe 90 pounds of that dividend and keep 10 pounds back for for a rainy day effectively. And so investment trusts are actually in a really interesting position where right now when income levels are falling because companies are cancelling their dividends uh, is that many of these trusts are sat on a reserve account. Uh, that they're able to use to top up the dividends that they get from the underlying companies to maybe maintain the payout that we've seen 
historical, or maybe even grow their dividend. But they are structured in a very different way, which will enable uh, or potentially enable these trusts to pay out higher levels of income than may be seen on their OIC or open ended um, equivalents there. So it's a structural difference that may make investment trusts an interesting place to look for income seekers. But I think to be totally clear, yeah, these, these income reserves are not uh, um, not an unlimited supply. Once they've been used, there is no reserve there. And you may well see over the next couple of years that income does actually fall back in investment trust as well. Um, so, so do bear that in mind. Now, we also had some questions in around suspended property funds. I think it's a really good question. So one of the things that happened in March um, is that all of the open-ended property funds um, had to suspend their dealing. So if you do uh, if you do own these, uh, then you are not able to uh, you're not able to trade uh, in in these, um, and uh, and that's a problem. Now they are doing that because um, because of uncertainty of pricing in the market, uh, and they're not able to uh, to get a clear valuation uh, of the assets. And so rather than enable you to trade out of a fund at a price that may not be real, um, is they are uh, suspending there until they get certainty as to what the underlying pricing is. Now, I'm acutely aware that my time uh, is, uh, is probably just about up. We've, we've been talking for about an hour. I'm really sorry if I haven't got through all of those questions that you sent in. Do send in your questions. We're really happy to get those and, and come back to you uh, and, and answer those um, questions for you. Um, so, so do fill in the feedback form. Do fill in your questions when that comes out to you. Thank you very much for listening and, and, uh, and dialing into this webinar. Uh, and it just finally, uh, just hope that you're all safe and well, your families are safe and well, uh, and do continue to, uh, to, stay, to stay safe. And uh, I very much look forward to speaking to you again very soon.